I was reading in a magazine recently and they were talking about the issue is the gospel, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And that's true. In many respects, that's very true. But we don't have to always use the term gospel or the gospel of this kingdom or kingdom to preach the gospel of the kingdom. There are so many facets and aspects to the gospel that are vital and essential for our Christian experience, beloved. Now, in the last three presentations that I've been sharing here on Sabbath morning, we've been talking a little bit about the Holy Flesh movement and some of the implications from that. And today we're really getting into what might be considered the real heart of what that issue was all about. I mentioned that Brother M. L. Andreessen, in his letters to the churches, he, um, he wrote this and noted that, and I, I quote from Andreessen, that God exempted Christ from the passions that corrupt men is the acme of all heresy. It is destruction of all true religion and completely nullifies the plan of redemption and makes God a deceiver and Christ his accomplice. Those are strong accusations to make. Strong accusations to make. But the fact is, Andreasen was speaking against certain things that were being taught in the book Questions on Doctrine. And we're going to be looking at some of the history of that in just a little bit. But this idea that Christ really wasn't tempted in all points like we are, he calls it the acme of all heresy. In 1899 to 1901, there was a movement in the Indianapolis Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church that became known as the Holy Flesh Movement. In this movement, it was taught that Jesus and his fight against sin and temptation was only as the sanctified believer experiences. William Grothier wrote a manuscript on the Holy Flesh Movement, probably understood it better than anyone else ever has studied it. And he summarized the Holy Flesh Movement by stating this, the leaders of the Holy Flesh Movement taught that Christ took the nature of Adam before the fall that Christ was a stranger to the fallen nature of man, except in its physical characteristics. He appeared as a man, yet was fully God, and therefore Satan did not overcome him by temptations from without, and not having assumed man's sinful nature, he could not be tempted from within. Now notice growth here is bringing out two areas of temptation. Temptations from without, for instance, when Satan directly tempts you or uses someone or an experience or a situation to cause you anguish, despair, anger, or something that would cause you to sin. But he also mentions the things within the nature of man that cause us temptations, the things within a man. R.S. Donnell was president of the Indiana Conference during the Holy Flesh Movement. And he wrote a track called The Nature of Christ and Man. And in that track, he explained some of the teachings of the Holy Flesh Movement. So this is getting it directly from those who are promoting it. And I'll just read you a couple of these. I, I've read them earlier, but I want to review them. I want you to understand, in case you haven't heard these before, or it's been a while, I want you to give you the background. I don't want you to be misunderstanding exactly what they taught. He says, now we know why Christ did not sin while he was here on earth. It was because he was God, and James has told us that God cannot be tempted with evil. Then he was not in sinful flesh, neither did he have sinful tendencies in him. He had no sinful tendencies or a tendency to do wrong in him. Donnell goes on, on page four of the track. He took a body which showed by its deteriorated condition that the effects of sin was shown by it, but his life proved that there was no sin in it. It was a body which the Father had prepared for him, Hebrews 10, 5. Christ's body represented a body redeemed from its fallen spiritual nature, but not from its fallen or deteriorated physical nature. It was a body redeemed from sin and with that body, Christ clothed his divinity. 
Now notice in the middle of this statement, he says that Christ's body represented a body redeemed from its fallen spiritual nature, but not from its fallen or deteriorated physical nature. So they, they understood in the Holy Flesh movement that Christ had a body that could be physically deteriorated, tired, hungry, could hurt, could be sick even. But nothing about the nature, the spiritual nature, had any tendencies to sin. They were talking about, then, the inner nature. Sometimes it's called instinct. And to those who were teaching this holy flesh doctrine, mind and nature were synonymous, or synonyms, and represented the fallen inheritance of man received as a result of the fall. Now, Ellen White, whom I believe with all my heart was a prophetess of God, was used of God in a very specific way in dealing with this movement. And she spoke in no uncertain terms about it and its teachings. And she said this, none are to pick up any points of this doctrine and call it truth. There is not a thread of truth in the whole fabric. Now, friends, she's not speaking about just simply the minor points. She says we're not to pick up any points, but if we're not to pick up any points, we certainly are not able and should not pick up the main points and call it truth. But that is exactly what has been done in Adventism now for over 60 years. And that resurgence of those ideas came about in the book, Questions on Doctrine. And they are being taught today, not only by the proponents of this so-called new theology, as Elder M. Allen Dreyasen labeled it, but they are being taught by people within the movement that teaches the truth about God as well. That's right. All under the auspice of teaching what they call righteousness by faith. Again, one of the main points of the Holy Flesh movement was that Christ did not accept the fallen nature of man except in its physical liabilities. The problem that we have, the problem that Andreasen had, the problem that Ellen White had, was that this shuts Christ away from having all of our temptations, specifically those which come within by our fallen natures. Now, I mentioned that this idea from the Holy Flesh movement was really revised during the time of the 1950s when the book Questions on Doctrine was published. You say, well, you know, that's been over 60 years ago. How does that affect us today? Well, these teachings are still being published today. These teachings are still being espoused today. And again, even among those who are within the Truth About God movement. And yet we've had all this time to study and to know better and to not be deceived by these Calvinistic types of teachings. The apostate book, Questions on Doctrine, taught the same teaching on the Incarnation that was taught by the Holy Flesh movement. That when we understand the taking of the fallen nature of man by Jesus, it was simply his physical nature. In other words, he could be tired. He could need sleep. He could be hungry and need food. I want to show you some of the statements in that book, Questions on Doctrine, and you will see that they are aligning themselves exactly with what the Holy Flesh movement was teaching. Exactly with the movement that Ellen White said none are to pick up a thread of this and call it truth. We have this statement first on Questions on Doctrine, pages 50 and 51. Moreover, at his incarnation, Christ became what he was not before. He took upon himself a human bodily form and accepted the limitations of human bodily life as the mode of existence while on earth among men. Now notice the emphasis here. It has nothing to do with a spiritual nature or nature. It's just simply the body, bodily form, bodily living. On page 52 of Questions on Doctrine, 
Elder Froome, the primary writer, if almost not the sole writer of Questions on Doctrine, stated, At his incarnation he became flesh. He hungered and thirsted and was weary. He needed food and rest and was refreshed by sleep. You see what he's saying? Again, it's all bodily. Now, there is a long section, not really long, it's less than a page, in Questions on Doctrine that tries to explain what it means when it says that he carried our sorrows and griefs. And I want to read you this section. It's not long. But what I'm reading here is quoted in the book Questions on Doctrine. And I've got a couple, three slides that cover this, so just be with me. First, they're quoting from Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Verse 3. Matthew refers to this passage. And they quote Matthew 8, 17. Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. They continue. The Weymouth translation reads, He took on him our weaknesses and bore the burden of our diseases. And the 20th century gives, quote, He took our infirmities on himself and bore the burden of our diseases. And then from the Septuagint, uh, they says, as, as he bore the Greek uh, Pharaoh from uh, the Septuagint, our iniquities, Isaiah 53, 11, so he bore Greek Anna Pharaoh, our weaknesses, Matthew 8, 17, Weymouth. And then they state this. But let us observe further what is implied in this. Notice the words used to express the thought, both in Isaiah 53 and in Matthew 8. He bore our grieves our sorrows, our infirmities, our sicknesses. The original words are also translated pains, diseases, and weaknesses. Page 58 of Questions on Doctrine. And you know what? We can agree with that. That's what the Bible says, right? But let's notice now how Questions on Doctrine interprets this or how we should understand it. Now on page 59 of Questions on Doctrine, it states, it could hardly be construed, however, from the record of either Isaiah or Matthew that Jesus was diseased or that he experienced the frailties to which our fallen human nature is heir. But he did bear all this. Could it not be that he bore this vicariously also, just as he bore the sins of the whole world? Questions on Doctrine, page 59. They're saying what he did, he did this vicariously. But what does vicarious mean? What does it mean vicariously? It means in a way that is experienced in the imagination through the actions of another person. New American Oxford Dictionary. The Merriman Webster says, experienced or realized through imagination or sympathetic participation in the experience of another. They're saying he bore it for us actually without being a part of it. Just sort of in play acting in mind only. Now, it's interesting that Ellen White never used the term vicariously in her writings. She used the term vicarious three times and only once referring to the atonement of Christ with that term. It was, it was, a, it was a term she didn't use. But Questions on Doctrine even tries to set forth the idea that this hermeneutic should be followed when reading other writings of Ellen White on the subject. On page 60 of Questions on Doctrine, it is in this sense, referring to this vicarious carrying the burdens, it is in this sense that all should understand the writings of Ellen G. White when she refers occasionally to sinful, fallen, and deteriorated human nature. In other words, he really didn't have it at all. That's what they're saying. Now, this wasn't the only time that Froome tried to introduce a hermeneutic to reinterpret Ellen White's writings. You know, we all use the same Bible, don't we? I mean, maybe not exactly all, but uh, there's the Catholic Bible that has the Apocrypha, right? And we have different translations, but fundamentally we say we all use the same Bible, but we have so many different interpretations, right? So many different ideas, and it's because of the way we interpret it. It's because of the hermeneutic. The hermeneutic is simply the, the, the term we use that expresses how we interpret or understand the Bible. 
So Froome says, here's the way you interpret Ellen White's writings when she speaks about him taking a fall in sinful nature. He simply did it vicariously. It wasn't that he really experienced it. But for those of you who have studied the book Questions on Doctrine in relationship to the atonement, you know that Froome also did this in respect to the atonement on pages 354 and 355 in Questions on Doctrine. He says, when, therefore, one hears an Adventist say or reads an Adventist literature, even in the writings of Ellen G. White, that Christ is making atonement now, it should be understood that we simply, it should be understood that we mean simply that Christ is now making application of the benefits of the sacrificial atonement he made on the cross. And the emphasis is in the original. So, he says, look, if you read that Ellen White's making atonement now, it really doesn't mean that. It means something else. And when you read that Ellen White wrote that Jesus took upon himself the, the fallen sinful nature of man, it really doesn't mean that. It means something else. In other words, it's how you can interpret will depend upon where you end up. Now, some of you know that, um, some of you have heard of Professor George Knight, former professor at Andrews University and prolific Adventist author. And you probably know that I don't have a lot of uh, love for most of his writings and his theology especially. But in 2007, for the 50th anniversary of the book Questions on Doctrine, there was a conference held at Andrews University and there was a republishing of the book Questions on Doctrine in what was called an annotated edition where George Knight took the book and put certain notes in it making certain historical explanations and what he considered maybe theological explanations. And I will have to give Knight credit for this one because he put a note concerning these, these statements of the vicarious acceptance. And he was right on this. And I want to give credit where credit is due. So here we go. This is a footnote that's in the annotated edition of Questions on Doctrine. And this footnote comes um, from page 56 of that edition. And I've got about four slides here for it. And it's making reference to pages 59 through 62 of the original book Questions on Doctrine. It says pages 59 through 62 set forth the rather curious position that Christ took human nature vicariously in the same way that he bore human sin vicariously. This is, according to Questions on Doctrine, Christ didn't really take on human <coughs> infirmities and weaknesses in the Incarnation as being innately his, but only in a vicarious or substitutionary sense. That position is certainly not set forth in the New Testament, nor was it the one held by Ellen White. In Desire of Ages, she claimed that, and he quotes Ellen White, Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. In quote, page 49 in Desire of Ages. Knight goes on, he says again, for 4,000 years, the race had been decreasing in physical strength, in mental power, and in moral worth. And Christ took upon him the infirmities of degenerate humanity. Page 117, italics supplied. Thus, according to Ellen White, at the incarnation, Christ actually, rather than vicariously, took upon himself our sinful nature. And he's making reference there to an article in the Review and Herald of December 15, 1896. And I checked his references out, and they are correct. Questions on Doctrine even tries to set forth the idea that this hermeneutic should be followed, again, when reading the writings of Ellen White, that it's vicarious, his atonement is, is, is something that's not going on in heaven today, his life on earth was really not a reality either. It just takes the heart out of the gospel takes the heart out of the gospel. Now let's proceed now to the point. Did Christ have temptations really like we have to be tempted? I want to look at a few texts. Let's first turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10. And here it says, For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, this expression for it became him. The word that we translate became is prepo. And it means to be fitting, proper, 
suitable, um, even under obligation. In other words, if, if you, in fact, if you look at m most other translations of this verse, even if they're translated from the received text, it will say something to the effect of it was fitting or it was proper for Christ to come and to live as we had to live and to suffer as we have to suffer. In Hebrews 2.17, it says, Wherefore, wherefore, in, what's the next little word? All. all. In all things, it behooved him, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. It says that it behooved him. Now this word behooved in the Greek is ophelio, and it means to be indebted to, to owe, must, to be obligated. Um, one of the lexicons of Lonida says to be necessary or indispensable. And so when Paul is writing, it, was, it behooved him. He was saying it was important, it was vital, it was in fact necessary for Christ to be made like unto his brethren. And if he wasn't, then the plan of salvation comes apart. Now I wanted to show you a few other places where this word, ophelio, is used. Where it says that um, it behooved him. He was under obligation. So you can sort of see the force of the word. Is that okay? The first one's in Luke 17. And it's really down in verse 10, but the parable is short enough that I can read it all. Luke 17, starting in verse 7. Luke 17, verses 7 through 10. Jesus says, But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, Go and sit down to meet? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink? Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. I think not. So likewise ye, when ye have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. That expression, was our duty, comes from the Greek word ophelio. The same word we translate in Hebrews 2.17, behooved. Also in 1 John 3.16, and you know, I like this, this word because it gives an emphasis in the text that you might not get just by a surface reading. 1 John 3.16. 1 John 3.16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We ought. We are under obligation to do this. You see, when you read this word ought in the Bible, it's not a should. Do you get it? Tammy, you should be nicer to Andy. Should. Well, she doesn't have to, maybe. But you must be nicer to Andy. That's different, isn't it? You see, and that's the, that's the force of this word that we translate ought here. And in fact, in the next chapter, in 1 John 4, 11, he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. It's not just a should, it's we must. Do you get it? We must love one another. And so, going back into the Hebrews 2.17, Wherefore, in all things, he must be made like unto his brethren. He must, not should. Now in Romans chapter 8, and we reviewed this text before, but I want to review it again. In Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, Paul here tells us for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, there's a, there's a, a word in this verse, in verse 3 here, 
that has been used to say, well, it really doesn't mean what it says. And that is the word that we translate likeness. Homoima. Homoima. And that word, it means a likeness or a, a, an identity to. And another place it's used that helps us to understand its, its force and its impact is in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7. Speaking of Jesus but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now, Jesus, friends, Jesus was not some phantom. He wasn't Casper the friendly ghost. He was a real man, wasn't he? And when it says he was made in the likeness of men, it's speaking and, and saying that very thing, that, that it, it just wasn't a similitude. It was the genuine thing. And so when he was made in the likeness of men, he was also made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now we quote John 3.16 a lot, and rightfully so. But if you go two verses before that, Jesus is saying something to Nicodemus here that's vitally important to us in connection with this. In John 3.14, Jesus says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus is saying to us that that serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness was a symbol of him. Remember the people, they were bitten by the, uh, the, 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 the poisonous vipers, by the vipers. And they were dying, and there was no cure. And God told Moses, you create this brazen snake, serpent, you put it on a pole and you lift it up, and anyone who can look upon it will live. You don't have to do anything else but just look and live. We look to Jesus and we live. Ellen White, writing in a, a pamphlet, pamphlet 80, it's in, entitled Special Instruction Relating to the Review and Herald Office and the Work in Battle Creek. This was a pamphlet written in 1896 on page 49, paragraph 1. She said this, What a strange symbol of Christ was that likeness of the serpent which stung them. This symbol was lifted on a pole, and they were to look to it and be healed. So Jesus was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came as the sin-bearer. Under the symbol of the uplifted serpent, he was presented before the vast congregation of those who were entrusted with sacred truth. So Jesus came as this symbol. Because that brazen serpent represented that he would come in the fallen nature of man. Now, was Jesus really tempted in all points like we are? Did he understand the struggles that we have, not only externally, but internally? I can't tell you how many times in the last two weeks I've been taking walks and meditating and praying and thinking about the situation that my family is currently going through right now. And I want to tell you that um, there have come with them from within me suggestions to do wrong things, to try to vindicate the situation. But that's wrong. And I have to fight that temptation even more than the direct assaults of Satan. In John chapter 2 and verses 24 and 25, John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. John writes about Jesus, and he says, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. The Greek says he was knowing what was in man. He was knowing what was in man. It wasn't just simply that Jesus had some kind of uh, telepathic powers to read the people's minds and he was knowing what was in them. That's not what it's saying at all. It's saying that Jesus understood the internal struggles of humanity. He knew what humanity was like because he was living in it at that very time. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, Hebrews 4.15 he says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 
Well, friends, I don't know how you define all, but all is simply all. It's not hard to understand. Either he had temptations from without and within, or he just had temptations from without, as the Holy Flesh Movement taught, as Questions on Doctrine taught, as this new theology within the Truth About God Movement is teaching. But if that's all he had, friends, then I can't and I will not be able to ever understand Hebrews 4.15. It will not make sense to me. Friends, this issue goes back to the very definition of sin. And that's where this whole problem began. It's, what the pro it's where the problem began back in the time of Questions on Doctrine. It's where the problem has begun in the year 2005. Because that's when this thing came into this movement in 2005. It's been 16 years now. We can either take the Armenian view, which says that sin is the transgression of the law, as stated in 1 John 3, 4, or we can take the Calvinistic view that says that sin is primarily your nature. Whether the promoters of this holy flesh doctrine realize it or not, they are redefining sin, and that changes everything. I want you to remember that Ellen White repeatedly stated that the only definition in the Bible for sin is the transgression of the law. In the Review and Herald of July 5, 1892, paragraph 8, the only definition the Bible gives of sin is that it is the transgression of the law. Only. She didn't say there's more. She didn't say there's three or four or two or five. And she says this repeatedly. I could produce at least 15 or 16 distinct and different statements that say this. This issue is about the nature of Jesus, and it is not a new issue. During Ellen White's life, there were questions sent to her, asking her about this point. And she responded, writing in the Review and Herald of February 18, 1890, in paragraph 6. She responded to this in the, publicly in the Review, and she said this, Letters have been coming in to me affirming that Christ could not have had the same nature as man, for if he had, he would have fallen under similar temptations. Similar temptations. Oh, we don't want him under similar temptations. We don't want him under our temptations. If he did not have man's nature, he could not be our example. If he was not a partaker of our nature, he could not have been tempted as man has been. If it were not possible for him to yield to temptation, he could not be our helper. It was a solemn reality that Christ came to fight the battles as man in man's behalf. His temptations and victory tell us that humanity must copy the pattern. Man must become a partaker of the divine nature. So Ellen White presents what the people are writing to her. And they, they say to her, well, if he had come like us in fallen nature, he couldn't be our redeemer because he'd be a sinner. Because if you have a fallen nature, that makes you a sinner because you understand sin as nature, not as the transgression of the law. But I ask you the question, can we be full overcomers? Can we be full overcomers? Well, Jesus, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21, he speaks there to the members of the Laodicean church. And he says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Does, does Jesus speak in tongue in cheek, as we say? Does he really mean this? Does he, does he say, well, I'd like for you to overcome, but let, like, the ability to overcome is like hanging on a stick 50 feet away from you, and you just can't ever reach it no matter how much you try to get to it. The stick just gets ahead of you a little further all the time. Or does he really mean that we can overcome? Is the Bible really true when it says, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling? Is the Bible really true when Jesus says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect? Can we really believe that? I believe that we can. In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, on page 336, 336.1, The Son of God was faultless 
And, and let me just pause for a minute. I don't think among those of us who are studying this, I'm hoping there's none of us who are studying this, who in any way believe that Christ ever sinned. We never have ever taught in any such way that there was a taint of sin in Christ. She says the Son of God was faultless. We must aim at this perfection and overcome as he overcame if we would have a seat at his right hand. So we have to overcome as he overcame. But friends, if he had an advantage upon us that is not available to us, if he didn't have to deal with some of the worst temptations that we have, how can we overcome as he overcame? Because he never overcame those things. Do you see how vital and important this is? So what do we really have to overcome? What do we really have to overcome? Well, oh, all things. All things. But those all things, friends, can be summarized in two areas. Here they are. Volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 47.1. We must war against temptations without and what else? Within. In other words, friends, if I was to take any one of us, and I was to take you somewhere out in the deep galaxies of outer space, and put you in quarantine. We've heard about quarantine a lot the last year, right? I'm going to put you in quarantine, but your quarantine is in such a way that there's no Satan, there's no evil angels, there's no, no, none of us misfits that can call, cause you to be upset or, or, or tempted in any way, and you're just there by yourself. Will you ever experience and understand temptation? And the answer is yes, you will, because the temptations are there within you already. But the temptations, friends, are not sin. It's only when we give in to the temptation, it's when we act upon the temptation, that it becomes sin. In Ministry of Healing on page 130 and paragraph 5, we are told not until the life of Christ becomes a vitalizing power in our lives can we resist the temptations that assail us from within and from without. So, we can never of ourselves, through our own power. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing, John 15, 5. But Paul says in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But she says that we need this vitalizing power of Christ because we have to fight from temptations that come from without and that come from within. In the Signs of the Times, April the 10th of 1893, in paragraph 3, and, and I've broken it into two parts, it's a long statement. We read this. We need not place the obedience of Christ by itself as something for which he was particularly adapted because of his divine nature. Let me just stop there. We know that divinity united with humanity, right? But she's saying here, in effect, that if there was something about his divine nature in combining it with his human nature that made him able to overcome like we have to overcome, um, then we, are, we have a problem. She says, we need not place the obedience of Christ by itself as something for which he was particularly adapted because of his divine nature. For he stood before God as man's representative and was tempted as man's sure, uh, substitute and surety. If Christ had a special power, which it is not the privilege of man to have, Satan would have made capital of this matter. Did you get that? If Christ had a special power, which is not the privilege of man to have. Now, he had a connection with God, didn't he? He had divine power working in his life. When I'm a sinner, living by myself, do I have that? No. But once I accept Christ, once I come to Christ and I plead to him, can I have that? Yes. So it's something I don't maybe inherently have, it's true, but it's something that's accessible to me just as much as it was accessible to Christ. If Christ had a special power by which it is not the privilege of man to have, Satan would have made capital of this matter. And I'm going to tell you, he makes capital of this matter before the throne of God today. These people are teaching that Christ was never tempted from within. That he didn't understand our, our temptations from within. Satan is laughing about it. He says, boy, they've fallen for a big one. But the work of Christ was to take from Satan his control of man, and he could do this only in a straightforward way. He came as a man to be tempted as a man, rendering the obedience of a man. 
Christ rendered obedience to God and overcame as humanity overcome. And then a little later in the paragraph, she says, to attribute to his nature a power that is not possible for man to have in his conflicts with Satan is to destroy the completeness of his humanity. The obedience of Christ to his Father was the same obedience that is required of man. But this new theology teaches that Jesus didn't have to overcome in a way that I have to overcome. No wonder Andreasen called it the acme of all heresy. Now, I'd like to close this session by just sharing with you uh, a part of Andreasen's thoughts on this. This is from Letters to the Churches, Series A, Number 1, Chapter 1. And I've broken it into, it's, it's one long paragraph, but I've broken it into four parts to make it easier to read on the slides. He says, If Christ had been exempt from passions, he would have been unable to understand or help mankind. It therefore behooved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. And he's making reference here to Hebrews 2, verses 17 and 18. Continues. A Savior who has never been tempted never has had to battle with passions, who has never offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him who was able to save him from death, who, though he were a son, never learned obedience by the things he suffered, but was exempt from the very things that a true Savior must experience, such a Savior is what this new theology offers us. It is not the kind of Savior I need, nor the world. One who has never struggled with passions can have no understanding of their power, nor has he ever had the joy of overcoming them. If God extended special favors and exemptions to Christ, in that very act he disqualified him for his work. There can be no heresy more harmful than that here discussed. It takes away the Savior I have known and substitutes for him a weak personality, not considered by God capable of resisting and conquering the passions which he asks men to overcome. M. L. Andreessen, Letters to the Churches, chapter 1. So what about these passions he speaks about? And what about the concept of propensities? Well, a passion is a strong and considered barely controllable emotion. A propensity is an inclination or natural tendency to behave in a particular way. The first and main synonym for propensity is tendency. He has a tendency to do this. I mean, even, even a car can be set up in such a way it has a tendency to steer to the right or to the left, right? A, t a tendency or a propensity. Now, I ask you a question. Is it wrong to have passions? Are passions wrong to have of themselves in the most basic fundamental form? Yes or no? Well, it really depends, doesn't it? It depends. Because I could have a strong passion to win souls. I could have a strong passion to tell others about Christ. Would that be wrong? No, but let's say that I have a, a, a strong sexually perverted passion of lust and flesh. Would that be right? No, of course not. That would be wrong. It would be wrong to have that kind of passion. What about propensities? Is it wrong to have certain propensities? I might have a propensity to be neat. I may have trained myself through to discipline and all, to, to be a neat person, to be a scheduled and orientated person. I have a tendency to be neat. And there are people who are, have a tendency to be late or sloppy, uncouth, right? So these items of themselves have to be quantified and judged in a context. It's okay to have a passion to win souls, but it's not okay to have a passion to eat unhealthy food, you see. So these things have to be qualified. It's good to have a passionate or a propensity 
to be on time, it would not be healthy to have a propensity to want to drink alcohol, for instance. The reason we bring this up is because the term propensity especially has come with much attention due to a personal letter that Ellen White wrote to a pastor, uh, W.L.H. Baker, who was laboring in Tasmania. Now, the letter is, is listed as a letter from 1895, but it's dated February the 9th of 1896. So it was either written in 1895, late 1895, or early 1896. Um, but this letter has caused much discussion, and we're going to be looking at it in detail at a later time. But because of a statement, and we'll look at at least one of those statements today that Ellen White made in that letter, people have taken and, and, and gotten a misunderstanding of what she was trying to say. And this happens, friends, in the Bible, too. I can read Revelation 14.11. And the fire of their torment ascendeth for ever and ever, right? And if I take that statement out of context or by itself or without looking at other statements, I might have a misunderstanding about hell, correct? I mean, we, we, we get that, right? So I want to now discuss a, a, a point of hermeneutics. Now, remember in, uh, in the first part of this discussion, we showed how in questions on doctrine, Froome tried to bring in some hermeneutics concerning the way that we should interpret Ellen White. For instance, when she speaks about if Christ had a fallen nature or a sinful nature, we should understand it simply to be vicarious. He said that if we read where Ellen White says Christ is making atonement now, it simply means something else. It really doesn't mean what it says. He's trying to give us a way to interpret those statements, a hermeneutic. But friends, the safest way to interpret Ellen White's statements is by the way she said to interpret them and to understand them, right? She said, for instance, concerning the testimonies, nothing is to be ignored, nothing is to be set aside, but time and place must be considered. That's in Select the Messages, book 1, page 57. But here's something that she noted. This is in Selected Messages, book 1, page 20, paragraph 2. Notice she says, The Bible must be given in the language of men. Everything that is human is imperfect. Different meanings are expressed by the same word. There's not one word for each distinct idea. Now, if this is true in the Bible, it certainly must be true also in her writings. And you can think of many words that convey different ideas depending on how they're used. I can think of the word saw. I saw the dog. I saw the sheep. I saw the wolf, right? I perceived it visually. I have a saw, something that cuts. I'm going to saw the board, it's something else. You know, it's an action, it becomes a verb now. And so we can use a word and it may have different meanings. And so sometimes if we take a word and we try to apply only one meaning to it, and one meaning only, it doesn't help us. Now with that in mind, I want to look at these two terms, passion or passions and propensity, propensities. And I want to see how Ellen White used these words in various contexts. In some passages, Ellen White uses the word passions to describe something that should be controlled. Did you get that? Something that should be controlled. Now the Bible, the Bible speaks about passions in a few places. In James chapter 5 and verse 17, there James writes that Elijah, or as the Greek into the English says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. It says that he was a man of like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly. So whatever these passions are it's speaking about, it wasn't something that prevented him from being a man of God. It wasn't something that prevented him from praying and seeking God and getting an answer from God. In the 14th chapter of Acts, there we read about the men of Lystra, that they tried to worship Paul and Barnabas as gods. And in Acts chapter 14 and verse 15, 
It says, and Paul was responding and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. So Paul is saying, look, Barnabas and I, we have like passions with you, but God helps us to preach this truth, to help pe turn people like you from these vanities to worship the true God. Interestingly, Ellen White speaks about Adam before his fall having passions. Here we go. This is in Patriarchs and Prophets. By the way, it's a good book. I'd recommend you read this book if you've never read it. Page 45 in paragraph 2. Referring to Adam, she says, his affections were pure, his appetites and passions were under the control of reason. He was holy and happy and bearing the image of God and in perfect obedience to his will. So, I ask you the question, is there anything wrong with having an appetite in general? No. no. An appetite, in fact, a good, healthy appetite is a wonderful thing. It's a healthy thing to have. And just as Adam had a pure appetite under the control of reason, he had passions, but they were under the control of reason. So there are some passions that we can have that are fine to have as long as they are under the control of reason. Speaking of Daniel in Prophets and Kings, page 546, paragraph 1. She speaks of Daniel and she says that he was a man of like passions as ourselves. The pen of inspiration describes him as without fault. So even though he had passions like us, he was described as without fault, right? So whatever passions he had, they were clearly under control. In Volume 3 of the Testimonies, page 569.3, it says there, every true Christian will have control of his appetite and passions. Unless he is free from the bondage and slavery of appetite, he cannot be a true obedient servant of Christ. It is the indulgence of appetite and passion which make the truth of none effect upon the heart. It is impossible for the spirit and power of the truth to sanctify a man, soul, body, and spirit when he is controlled by appetite and passion. Again, is it wrong to have an appetite of itself? Is it wrong to be controlled by your appetite? Absolutely. Is it wrong to have certain passions? No. But is it wrong to be controlled by those passions? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Here's another statement. This is from Volume 3 of the Testimonies also, just a little earlier in the uh, same section on page 564.3. This is an interesting statement. I hope it was true in the time she wrote it. I'm sure it was. I'm not sure how applicable this is today in the sense of, you, you'll see when I read it here. Our youth want mothers who will teach them from their very cradles to control passion, to deny appetite, and to overcome selfishness. I don't know if the youth want that today or not, but in her day she could say that, and it was true. But if you think about it, what do children really want? Children really and truly, when they're young, they don't want total freedom because they innately know that it's not right. They know they need discipline. They know they need restrictions. And our youth want mothers who will teach them from the very cradles to control passion, to deny appetite, and to overcome selfishness. They need line upon line and precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. I remember a story of some young people talking to, to, to a dean at one of our academies one time. And, and, and one student was saying that his parents allowed him to do this and this and that. And another student said his parents basically put no restrictions on him. He could do anything he wanted. And another student said, you know, that their parents just gave them a car and anything else they wanted. And, and one of the students spoke up and said, our parents really didn't love us, do they? They don't really love us, do they? And they were astute enough, even at that young age, to realize to live without control was not love. Now, Ellen White also speaks about propensities and that there are propensities that should be controlled. Neither the words propensities or tendencies or their variations are used in the Bible. 
but they are certainly used in the spirit of prophecy. And just as Ellen White spoke of passions that need to be controlled, she spoke of propensities that need to be under control. So here is our first statement, and it's from Volume 4 of the Testimonies, page 235 in paragraph 1. It is the grace of God that you need in order that your thoughts may be disciplined to flow in the right channel, that the words you utter may be right words, and that your passions and appetites may be subject to the control of reason. There we see passions again. Under reason, control of reason. The greatest triumph given us by the religion of Christ is control over ourselves. Our natural propensities must be controlled or we can never overcome as Christ overcame. Now, friends, that's a very powerful statement because it has some strong implications in it. It says our natural propensities must be controlled. She says we have certain propensities that have to be controlled because if we don't, we can never overcome as Christ overcame. Did you get that? We have to overcome as Christ overcame. Does that mean that Christ had to overcome natural propensities? Yes, he did. He had to overcome natural propensities too. And friends, if he didn't have temptation from within, he didn't have natural propensities to overcome. Here's another statement. And this is from Adventist Home, page 127, paragraph 2. The corrupt thought is to be expelled. Every thought is to be brought into captivity to Jesus Christ. All animal propensities are to be subjected to the higher powers of the soul. And here Ellen White uses the term animal in a biological sense. You know, that of the flesh must be brought under control. In the Health Reformer of March the 1st, 1878, she says, if enlightened, intellect holds the reins controlling the animal propensities and keeping them into subjection to the moral powers. Satan well knows that his power to overcome with his temptations is very small. So here she speaks again about these animal propensities, these biological propensities, and she says that they are to be controlled. It says controlling them, keeping them in subjection to the moral powers. No doubt Ellen White had this idea in mind when she wrote the following. Though he, referring to Jesus, had all the strength of passion of humanity, never did he yield to temptation to do one single act which was not pure and elevating and ennobling. And that's in Heavenly Places, page 155.7. She says in the Review and Herald of February 10, 1885, paragraph 7, he, that is Jesus, was made like unto his brethren with the same susceptibilities, mental and physical. He was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin, and he knows how to succor those who are tempted. Now, do you see that word I have highlighted, susceptibilities? Do you know what the, the source gives as a synonym for susceptibilities? It gives propensities. Propensities. A propensity and a susceptibility are the same thing. They carry the same meaning. Clearly, we see that Jesus had both passions and propensities, and yet they were controlled. They were controlled by the higher moral powers. He lived out his life without sinning. And this is the same experience that we are to have if we are to overcome as he overcame. Now I want to see, want to, want to look at how these terms, passions and propensities, are now used in another way. Remember she said that sometimes words aren't always used in the same way. We read about certain passions and propensities that had to be controlled. But now we're going to see that there are certain types of passions as well as propensities that otherwise this has, has to be eliminated, have to be put to death, in other words. And in the Tsar of Ages, on page 302 in paragraph 4. She says, The only power that can create or perpetuate true peace is the grace of Christ. The grace of Christ. When this is implanted in the heart, it, the grace of Christ, will cast out the evil passions that cause strife and dissension. 
So there are some passions that we have that are fine. They, they must simply be controlled. They have to be put under temperance. But there are some types of passions, and here she specifically speaks of evil passions that cause strife and dissension, and she says they have to be cast out. Here's another statement, and this is from Gospel Workers, uh, the 1915 edition, page 127.3. And with a couple exceptions here, I've tried to, to source out these statements from uh, sources that were published during the life of Ellen White. Unholy passions. Now this speaks of unholy passions. What must unholy passions, what must happen to them, she says. Unholy passions must be crucified. Something that's crucified is put to death. Destroyed. So there are evil passions that must be cast out. There are unholy passions that must be crucified. But there are some kind of passions that she says have to be controlled. She speaks about these unholy passions and she says they, the unholy passions, will clamor for indulgence. But God has implanted in the heart high and holy purposes and desires and these need not be debased. See? There's different kinds. It is only when we refuse to submit to the control of reason and conscience that we are dragged down. Paul declares, I can do all things through Christ. And then in volume three of the testimonies on page 84 in paragraph one, she says, the unsanctified will and passions must be crucified. So here again, must be crucified. The unsanctified will, the unsanctified passions, these things must be crucified. Now, we saw earlier passions and propensities connected. And here we will find them also connected in this context. And that's in Testimonies for the Church, volume 2, page 474.1. I realize this is a little technical. And uh, again, we have these slides available on the website. We will be publishing this in OPAS in a month or so. And so you'll have all these references available to you. But you need to know these points. Here, Ellen White is speaking about the wife. And she says she, or the wife, is made an instrument to minister to the gratification of low lustful propensities. And very many women submit to become slaves to lustful passion. They do not possess their bodies in sanctification and honor. So here she connects these ideas of lustful propensities and lustful passions. And she makes it clear that these are not acceptable items. Ellen White also speaks out, and I won't take time to go through all these, but I'll just give you some references. She speaks about depraved passions, and that's in volume 2, 474.2. She speaks about corrupt passions, volume 2, page 410, paragraph 1. She speaks about gross passions, 3T, 475.2, and spiritual gifts, volume 4A, page 148.2. She speaks of murderous passion, Patriarchs and Prophets, 658.3. Perverted Passions, 3T, 226.2. She speaks of evil passions, Desire of Ages, 115.1, and First, Tem First Te Testimonies, 188.1. And then finally, she speaks about vicious passions, Volume 2 of the Testimonies, 468.1. Friends, if we were to simply try to live with these kind of passions and simply keep them under control, we will accomplish very little. This type of passion is not the one that is to be controlled. This is the type of passion that is to be crucified. This is the type of passion that is to be cast out, to be put to death. Now, she also spoke not only about passions that had to be eliminated, but she spoke about propensities that needed to be eliminated. In a uh, little work called Special Testimonies to Our Ministers, number 2, page 20, paragraph 2, written in 1892. And it's also published in Testimonies to Ministers, 171.1, but I just wanted to make sure you understood that it was published during her lifetime. She says, but although their evil propensities may seem to them as precious as the right hand or the right eye, they must be separated from the worker or he cannot be acceptable before God. So there's evil propensities that she speaks about, and they just can't be left with us to simply be controlled. They have to be cast out. They have to be put to death. They have to be crucified. In the Youth Instructor of June 22, 1899, here she speaks about nonsense and amusement-loving propensities should be discarded. 
as out of place in the life and experience of those who are living by faith on the Son of God, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. There are many other similar statements. I won't go through them in detail, but here's a list of just some other descriptions of types of propensities that Ellen White speaks about, where it is apparent that she's not simply speaking about controlling them, but rather eliminating them. Controlling them just couldn't be the proper solution. For instance, she speaks about money-loving propensities in Volume 3, page 545.1. She speaks about scandal-loving propensities, 5T, 57.2. Selfish propensities, 7T, 204.1. Lustful propensities, Volume 2, 391.1. But friends, as much as there is evil and wrong passions and propensities enough for all of us, there is courage. There is courage. Because we are told in the Review and Herald of April 24, 1900, and paragraph 6, she says, we need not retain one sinful propensity. In other words, any of the wrong kind of propensities. And passions is also understood here. We don't have to retain them. She doesn't simply say that we have to keep them down. We, we don't even have to retain them. It would certainly be this kind of passion or propensity that Ellen White had in mind when she wrote of Christ the following. He was a mighty petitioner, not possessing the passions of our human fallen natures, but compassed with like infirmities, tempted in all points even as we are. Jesus endured agony which required help and support from his Father, volume 2 of the Testimonies, 508.2. Again, there were different kinds of passions and propensities. And when she speaks about these kind of passions and propensities, it's obvious that she must be speaking, if we look at the, you know, line upon line, here a little, there a little, all the different testimonies, we see that she's speaking about those passions and propensities that have to be eliminated, that we have to eliminate. Those are the ones that were not in his life. She also says in volume two of the testimonies, 201.2, he is our example in all things. He is a brother in our infirmities, but not in possessing like passions as the sinless one. His nature recoiled from evil. So there were evil passions that he didn't have because he never sinned. He never acted upon that which was wrong. We today, some of us have passions and propensities because we've acted upon sin, right? We've acted upon sin. It's interesting. I want you to look at this statement carefully. Look at this statement again carefully. And I'll read it one more time. He is our example in all things. He is a brother in our infirmities, but not in possessing like passions as the sinless one, his nature recoiled from evil. Now, this statement was used as the basis for a statement in Steps to Christ. But part of this was actually left off. And I don't know why, except that perhaps there, the, the, that there was a desire that there wouldn't be any confusion because some people might take the statement and, make, and, and be confused by it. But in Steps to Christ, it reads like this. It says, He is a brother in our infirmities, in all points tempted like as we are, but as the sinless one, his nature recoiled from evil. Notice, but not in possessing like passions was removed from the statement in Steps to Christ. It doesn't mean that that was wrong when it was put in the testimonies. But they just wanted a more clear statement where people couldn't possibly stumble. Now, the Baker letter. The Baker letter. Let's look at one of the famous statements from the Baker letter with these points in mind. Ellen White was writing to this brother and sister Baker. They were, as I said, working in Tasmania, uh, which is a, a, actually a part of the, the nation of Australia. It may not be on the continent, per se, but it's part, it's like a state of Australia. You have New South Wales, you have Queensland, the Northern Territory, and you have Tasmania. It's a little island which makes up the equivalent of a state or a province of Australia. And they were discouraged. They were discouraged. In fact, Ellen White be, opened her letter stating something to the effect of, look, you know, the, the, the Lord doesn't measure everything by numbers. And if you just win one soul, the Lord will not count your work a failure. That's been one of the most encouraging statements I've ever seen for me, too, sometimes. You'd like to see more done. But of this letter, 
which has, and, and I don't have the exact number in my memory, except it's about 29 paragraphs. About seven paragraphs deal with Christ and the Incarnation. It's not a letter that solely deals with this subject. It was a letter, it was a personal letter she wrote, and it was never published, any of it was never released until about the time of questions on doctrine. So it was not something that she published in her lifetime. And remember that she said that if you want to know what Ellen White believes on a subject, read her, read her published writings. Read her published writings. But she wrote this, and it's in the Baker letter that's uh, listed as letter 8 of 1895, although it's dated in 1896. But it's in Letters and Manuscripts, volume 10, in, in its entirety. And paragraph 14 says, he could have sinned, he could have fallen, but not for one moment was, in, was there in him an evil propensity. An evil propensity. See? And we'll look at some other of those statements um, next week in, in more detail. But Ellen White was aware of the fact that some words must sometimes be used to express different ideas. We find an example of this problem in her use of the words passions and propensities. She used both words, but she used them at times in different ways. She equated passions with propensities in each of the two different ways she used them. In one usage, both words, passions and propensities, are used to describe something that Christians must control, but that by their very nature of things they must retain and cannot eliminate from their experience. In this usage, she tends to link the word propensity with such descriptive terms as animal, human, natural. In the other usage, both passions and propensities are used to describe something that Christians need not retain. In fact, they must not retain. They must eliminate. Here, control is not adequate as a solution for the problem. In this usage, she tends to link the words propensity with other terms such as evil, sinful, lustful, etc. In her references to Christ, she indicated that he had one class of passions and propensities, but did not have the other. And so we see her statements on that subject as complementary and not contradictory. Just like we take Bible texts that we don't at first think fit together, but we know that they complement each other in some way, like Revelation 14.11. And so I just want to put a couple of the statements here together in comparison, not in contrast, that we've went over before. But for instance, in passions, notice on the left, though he had all the strength of passion of humanity, never did he yield to temptation to do one single act which was not pure and elevating and ennobling in heavenly places, 155.7. But across from that, he was a mighty petitioner, not possessing the passions of our human fallen natures but compassed with like infirmities tempted in all points, even as we are, volume 2508.2. She spoke of propensities. She said he was made like his brethren with the same susceptibilities. And you remember what a synonym for susceptibility is? Propensity. But she says there wasn't in him an evil propensity. She speaks about our natural propensities must be controlled. Now again, the Baker letter was written in 18, either the last part of 1895 or the first part of 1896. It's a little, little milky to know where it really is supposed to fit. But if we go back to that time in Adventism, the leading preacher in Adventism that spoke and dwelt on the Incarnation was A.T. Jones. A.T. Jones. And it might be of interest to you what A.T. Jones said at the 1895 General Conference session because he's speaking about Christ. And so I wanted to share with you just a few uh, paragraphs of one of his sermons from the 1895 General Conference uh, Bulletin. Notice he begins right off. This is the first part of his sermon, the first paragraph. This is from the Bulletin of February 25, 1895. And if you have them in hard copy, it's page 
And he starts with something right at the beginning. He says, Now as to Christ not having like passions with us, in the scriptures all the way through, he is like us and with us according to the flesh. He is the seed of David according to the flesh. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Don't go too far. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, not in the likeness of sinful mind. Do not drag his mind into it. His flesh was our flesh, but the mind was the mind of Christ Jesus. Therefore, it is written, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If he had taken our mind, how then could we ever have been exhorted to let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus? It would have been so already. But what kind of mind is ours? Oh, it is corrupted with sin also. Look at ourselves in the second chapter of Ephesians, beginning with the first verse and reading to the third. But the third verse is the one that has this particular point in it. And then Jones goes on to quote that. Then going on to um, the next page, he says this. Now the flesh of Jesus Christ was our flesh. And in it was all that is in our flesh. All the tendencies to sin that are in our flesh were in his flesh, drawing upon him to get him to consent to sin. Suppose he had consented to sin with his mind. What then? Then his mind would have been corrupted. And then he would have become like, become of like passions like us. But in that case, he himself would have been a sinner. He would have been entirely enslaved, and we all would have been entirely enslaved, and we all would have been lost. Everything would have perished. Now notice here, John says, that Christ in his flesh had all the tendencies of sin that are in our flesh. Now, when we think of the 1888 message, and we call it the 1888 message because it was delivered in 1888 by two men. Who were those two men? Jones and Wagoner. So this is half of that duet right here. And we have people today who are professing to teach righteousness by faith. They're professing that they're teaching you something grand and glorious about Jesus. And they're directly contradicting one of the 188 messengers. Now, again, Jones is not the inspired source. The inspired source is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. But I'm showing you what Jones, how he understood these points. And Ellen White said... You know, that, that God sent a message through these messengers. goes on. Where does he, referring to Satan, where does Satan start the temptation? In the flesh. Satan reaches the mind through the flesh. God reaches the flesh through the mind. Satan controls the mind through the flesh. Through this means, through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, and through ambition for the world and the honor and respect of men, through these things, Satan draws upon us, upon our minds to get us to yield. Our minds respond, and we cherish that thing. I'm going to just pause here for a minute before I go on to the next slide. I want you to remember that your brain is not your mind. Did you get that? Your brain is not your mind. Your brain is a bodily, fleshly organ, just like your heart, liver, or anything else. It's not your mind. We are told that the mind functions through the brain, right, primarily. But I, I, I'm reminded of, uh, of a uh, medical incident that happened a few years ago. There was a woman who was quite sick. She had both diseased lungs and heart. And she was in need of, of what they called a heart-lung transplant, where you have to have both the heart and both lungs together at one time. And it's pretty hard to get that. Well, it just so happened that there was a young man who was on a motorcycle and had an accident, and he ended up being, quote, brain dead or whatever, and he became a match for her. And they transplanted her heart and lungs, part of her flesh, I'm sorry, part of his flesh into her body, right? When she woke up, when this woman who had been prior to this a teetotaler woke up, she wanted a beer. 
She wanted a beer. She wanted to drink a beer. Mm -hmm. What? They found out that this motorcyclist that was killed, he liked to drink beer. Her favorite color became his favorite color. Mm -hmm. Or his favorite color became her favorite color. I don't understand how that works. I don't get it. But what I'm telling you is this. There's a lot more power in the flesh than you realize. And Satan is trying to use that flesh to control your mind. But God, friends, is trying to do the opposite. He's trying to take your minds and control your flesh. Jones continues, By this means, his temptations assert their power. Then we have sinned. But until that drawing of our flesh is cherished, there is no sin. There is temptation, but not sin. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away thus and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, when that desire is cherished, then it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings, bringeth forth death. And that's from the General Conference Building, again, of February 25, 1895. That's just a little microcosm of the perspective that A.T. Jones had on this. Now, when he said in the very beginning of this, um, this that he says, now as to Christ not having like passions with us, he later explains that. And, and I'll just take a minute to explain that. Because he says, I know in the testimonies it says that he didn't have like passions like us. He says, you can read it in the testimonies. He says, but if you read them all the way through and understand what they say, you'll get what it means. And I think what A.T. Jones was in effect saying in a simplified way is what we've just said here today. That there were certain types of passions that were evil that, 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 that you just could not retain. You had to get rid of. But Christ understood the tendencies and the temptations that we have that are natural, that are part of our very being because we have a fallen, sinful nature. And he wants to eliminate the control that they have over us. He wants to crucify the passions and propensities that we have that are evil and wrong in themselves, just without control, they're wrong. But if Jesus didn't step down, friends, to the bottom of the ladder, he can't help me. It's like I'm down in a deep pit and you put a ladder down in, but you leave off the bottom rung or two. And someone comes down and says, well, I'm here to help you. But friends, if they don't come all the way down, you don't get the help, do you? And Jesus had to come all the way down so he could help us. As A.T. Jones says, his mind was ever pure. He says, don't drag his mind into it. His mind was the mind of Christ Jesus. In Luke chapter 1, verse 35, it says, that holy thing which shall be born, you shall be called the Son of God. That holy thing, or as the Greek would, would more accurately render, that Holy Spirit. Spirit is mind, that holy mind. And yet he had, we are told, a human mind also. In other words, he had a mind that functions like a human mind functions, that has the limitations of a human mind, that has the, the boundaries, if you please, of the human mind, the capabilities of human mind. And through that, as he combined humanity with divinity, he overcame, just as we will overcome when we combine divinity with humanity. And that's what I want in my life. It's what I want in yours. It's what I desperately want in this one true God movement. This truth about God movement. Whatever we want to call it. We, we have these different little monikers we put upon it. But friends, this movement is too good. It's too precious. It's too important. It's too much of God. To allow it. To allow it to be contaminated with the teaching the Ellen White said there's not a thread of truth in the entire fabric. E.J. Wagoner, I don't have the reference here, but I can get it for you later. But E.J. Wagoner, when he was speaking at the 1901 General Conference session, and he was making reference to this Holy Flesh movement, and he says, you know, he asked the question, he says, have we come out, really have we come all the way out of the Church of Rome? He says, because it seems like that there's some that still have the marks here. They haven't quite all the way come out. Because he understood that all this ties together. Remember we've mentioned this term systematic theology? How all these doctrines tie together? Because friends, not only do we have this all tying together with the nature of Christ and with the definition of sin, but we also have something called the, uh, uh, the doctrine of original sin that also enters into this. This is part of it. 
it comes in and becomes a part. And we can examine that another time, but we've went long enough now. And we, we're going to close off this meeting. But friends, I appeal to you to look at these references, to study them out. Don't take my word for any of this. Study it for yourself. Study as much on it as you can for yourself. And you will find that Ellen White does indeed give clarification and classification on how she uses these terms. And we just can't take one statement from one letter and make it apply to everything else. It just isn't fair. It isn't good hermeneutics. And it won't suffice to, to bring us to the state of perfection that God wants us to be. Thank you for your time today. May God bless you lots and lots and lots.